Greetings everyone, and thanks for your continued support. In this series of episodes, I will be explaining everything there is to know about legal costs. Interestingly, I decided to release this episode after a recent interaction I had with a client of mine. The said interaction came about after obtaining judgments in my client's favour and having our bill of costs taxed. Upon perusal of the tax bill, my client advised that he did not understand why the amount on the bill does not equate to the total costs he had paid to date. In fact, he was quite irritated at the fact that he could not recover 100% of the legal fees he had incurred. It is therefore imperative that legal costs and the recovery thereof are explained in detail to the client before proceeding with the matter. I will be discussing this in depth, but before we start, take note that legal costs are awarded, and therefore recoverable, on one of three scales, namely party and party, attorney and client, or attorney and own client. This first episode will pertain to legal fees paid to one's own attorney, but you only get to watch it if you subscribe and share this channel with anyone who may benefit from it. Legal fees paid to your own attorney. Attorneys receive a lot of criticism for the cost of their services, but what professional service is cheap? Just like doctors and accountants, Attorneys and advocates are experts who spend many grueling years accumulating the requisite knowledge and expertise. Be that as it may, some people and businesses will require the services of an attorney at least once in their life. Some will even require such services on a regular basis. The services provided by attorneys are vast and can differ from firm to firm. Most commonly, you can expect an attorney to provide, at minimum, services pertaining to debt collection, property transfers, contract interpretation and drafting, and divorces. As mentioned, however, most law firms provide a much wider range of services, and specialties may differ between firms. Let's move on. A relationship between an attorney and their clients usually forms during a consultation at the attorney's offices. A consultation is generally arranged by the client after discovering the need for legal assistance. Some attorneys require that a deposit be paid into their trust account prior to the consultation taking place whereas some require payment of the deposit only after the consultation. Some attorneys do not require payment of a deposit at all. Deposits are often requested as security for attorneys, as non-payment of accounts is unfortunately quite common. If the full value of the deposit is not utilised by the attorney, the balance will be repaid after his fees have been deducted. Deposits are paid into the firm's trust account, and the amount to be paid will vary depending on the firm and the relevant circumstances. Whether or not a deposit is required, it is generally the case that during the initial consult with an attorney, the client will be provided with said attorney's fee structure. The client may also be required to sign a mandate or agreement inclusive of the fee structure. An attorney's fee structure is set out on a document or in an agreement and specifies the attorney's hourly rate, task-specific fees and any other relevant information. An example of a fee structure is the following. You'll see it has fees for drafting letters, issuing summons, drafting pleadings, instructions to sheriffs, consultations. You'll see there's a lot of hourly rate charges on there. Um, at the end, you'll see that the fee structure specifically makes mention of what it excludes, such as disbursements, um, such as advocates and sheriff fees, VATs. Um, also makes mention of the payment terms, being 30 days from receipts of invoice, and the fact that we may require deposits. Take note that fee structures will differ depending on the firm, as well as the seniority of the attorney. Some attorneys may simply charge their hourly rate for everything. In this regard, if a task takes 15 minutes to complete, the attorney will charge a quarter of his hourly rate. As I've just mentioned, hourly rates will differ depending on the seniority of the attorney. For example, a senior attorney could charge anywhere between 2,000 and 3,800 Rand per hour. A junior attorney could charge roughly 1,000 to 1,900 Rand per hour, and a candidate legal practitioner will generally not charge more than 1,200 Rand per hour. Take note that the rates mentioned above are purely rough guidelines, and attorneys are allowed to charge what they deem as a reasonable amount for their services. Take note further that the time required for each task, process, or procedure cannot be pre-quantified precisely. Any cost estimates will be subject to various factors, such as the complexity of the matter and the inherent unpredictability of litigation. 
Clients must also be cautioned that they will be billed for almost every interaction with the attorney. For example, any emails or telephone calls received or sent by the attorney will, in most cases, attract a fee. In this regard, see the fee structure I showed you. An attorney and her client may, however, deviate from said attorney's standard fee structure and agree to alternative rates and charges. This often happens where the client is a large corporation and the law firm is appointed to the client's panel of attorneys. In such instances, the attorney usually renders services for the client on a continual basis and the client has a lot more say insofar as the attorney's fees are concerned. This can be mutually beneficial in that the client benefits from lower fees, whereas the attorney benefits from regular instructions. Back to the fee structure example that I just showed you. You'll note that the fees expressly exclude disbursements and VAT. This is almost always the case. Insofar as VAT is concerned, the client will need to bear in mind that if her attorney charges 1,000 Rand per hour, she will be invoiced in the amount of 1,150 Rand, as 150 Rand will consist of VAT. The VAT amount is paid to the attorney, who will in turn pay same to SARS when due. A disbursement is a payment made by an attorney to a third party, which is then claimed back from the client. Depending on the nature of the matter, disbursements can include inter alia, advocates fees, sheriff costs, expert witness expenses, adverts and cost consultants fees. The most important disbursement to which the client is to be aware is advocates fees. Advocates, more commonly referred to as counsel, tend to have specialized expertise in various areas of law, such as family law, banking law, etc., but are primarily experts in presenting and arguing cases in court. Attorneys often require, which is also known as brief, advocates to draft pleadings, etc., and to appear in court. For more information on advocates, see my episode on the differences between attorneys and advocates. The reason why such a disbursement is so important is because advocates are completely independent of the attorney or firm whose services the client is utilizing. What this means is that the fee structure the attorney presented to the client does not constitute or reflect the fees the advocate will charge. Advocates generally charge their hourly rate for everything, which can vary depending on the number of factors. The most notable factor is the advocate's seniority. In other words, whether they are junior counsel or senior counsel, also known as SILC or SC. The hourly rates of the two counsel will be massively different. A junior advocate, for example, could charge 1,400 Rand per hour, whereas a senior advocate could charge 3,600 Rand. These hourly rates are generally VAT exclusive as well. It is therefore imperative that the client ascertains from the attorney whether the counsel employed is junior or senior, as well as the said counsel's rates. Counsel fees are disbursements, meaning that the advocate will invoice the attorney's firm directly and the firm will in turn invoice the client. As the advocate does not contract directly with the client, but rather with the firm, it is the firm that is liable for the advocate's fees. Therefore, if the client does not pay the disbursement reflected on the firm's invoice, then the firm will be indebted to the advocate and the client will be indebted to the firm. I'm sure you now understand why deposits are often requested by attorneys. Very important, fees and disbursements are payable regardless of whether the case is won or lost. You will note from the example fee structure that the firm's invoices are strictly payable within 30 days of receipt thereof. In most cases, invoices are either payable upon presentation or within 30 days of receipt thereof. And payments is generally made via EFT. Therefore, the client will be making regular payments to the attorney whilst the matter is ongoing. It is only when a cost order is awarded in the client's favour may a portion of the legal fees already incurred be recovered from the opposition. This means that the client will need adequate funds to sustain the case until such time as a cost order is awarded. There are, however, a few exceptions to this, such as matters taken on a pro bono, pro amico, or pro dio basis, or where a contingency fee agreement has been concluded between the attorney and client. Pro bono is a Latin term meaning for the public good. In the legal profession, it refers to work that is done without charge or at a reduced fee for those who are unable to afford the services of an attorney. In a broader sense, the term can be used to describe any professional work done without charge for the benefit of the community. Pro amico is a Latin term meaning for a friend. It refers to legal action instituted by an attorney for the benefit of a friend or acquaintance rather than for personal gain. Pro dio means free of charge litigation held for both the plaintiff and defendant who are unable to pay the relevant fees. A contingency fee agreement, also known as a no-win-no-fee agreement, is an agreement entered into between an attorney and their client 
in which it is agreed that the attorney will only receive payment of his fees should there be a successful outcome of the matter. In other words, the fee is contingent upon the outcome of the case. Contingency fee agreements are relatively common in personal injury, medical negligence and class action lawsuits. Contingency fee agreements are regulated by the Legal Practice Act, which sets out certain conditions that must be met for such agreements to be valid. The Act also provides guidelines for the calculation of contingency fees, including maximum percentages that may be charged and limits on the amounts that may be recovered. Contingency fee agreements are further regulated by the Contingency Fees Act. The Contingency Fees Act sets limits on the maximum percentage of the recovery that an attorney may charge as a contingency fee in the event of a successful outcome in the case. The maximum contingency fee that an attorney may charge in the event of a successful outcome is determined as follows. In the case of a claim for a sum of money, the contingency fee may not exceed 25% of the first 250,000 Rand recovered and 20% of any amount recovered in excess of 250,000 Rand. In the case of a claim for the delivery of specific performance or the performance of a specific act, the contingency fee may not exceed 25% of the value of the property or the value of the act, as the case may be. Notwithstanding the above, the client and attorney may agree that in the event that the case is won, the attorney will be paid his actual legal fees incurred for services rendered. In this case, there is no statutory cap on the fee amount. Before we get to the next episode in the series, it is extremely important to note that should a cost order be awarded in favour of the other party, the client, over and above his own attorney's fees, will have to pay the opposition's fees in an amount determined by the taxing master. Furthermore, as previously mentioned, should an order be granted in the client's favour, costs will most likely be awarded, but on a certain scale. An example of a court order including a cost award is the following. There are three scales on which costs may be awarded, namely party and party, attorney and client, or attorney and own client. The quantum of costs recoverable by the client will depend on the scale on which the costs are awarded. In the next episode, we'll be discussing the first scale of costs, namely costs as between party and party. Stay tuned.